Thank you very much uh, for your invitation. Really, I'm surprised to be here together with you. Um, and uh, first of all, I have to excuse me because I can't speak well English, but I try to give uh, my uh, conference giving English. But I, I would like to ask uh, my, my friend to help him, to help me, uh, please. Um, and uh, then the second thing that, uh, so I'm a, I'm a, a sample monk, a spiritual man, and uh, I can't um, speak uh, about the, uh, the situation of Hungary, but I would like to add uh, uh, a sample. No, oh, it's good, it's good. Uh, okay. uh, I sam uh, add a uh, spiritual thought. Uh, to this uh, discussion, I hope it can be useful uh, for us, for us too. Uh, I, sp I would like to speak about the leadership and the conscience. The title uh, isn't uh, written there. Uh, it's a phrase of uh, Hungarian writers. Uh, if he who stands uh, on the summit is not sent, who else can attract our souls to look upwards? Um, if you are endowed with authority, it is not enough to be a leader. You must also be a compass who points in the right direction as he soon as others see him. He warns us of going astray not only by his raised voice, but his very existence. It is a leader's duty to serve as a, an example to others. In other words, to become the living conscience of his people. This applies even more strongly to political leaders as they are entrusted with the government of an entire country, not just a group or a company. Can a country or a nation have a conscience? Can the soul of many different people be treated as one? Can the words of a shared conscience be captured? Each of us thinks in different ways and follows different ideas. A group, a company, or a church community is motivated by the same goal, so a cohesive spirit can be defined more clearly. The, co co the, the cohesive force of a nation appears in a quite different manner. There are shared motives, even a shared goal can be set, but a shared spiritual way of thinking which could form the basis of shared conscience cannot be formed. Another reason a nation is incapable of having a conscience is its lack of a soul. Only individuals have souls and capable of salvation. What I wish to point out here is simply, simply that a nation needs individuals who, by their very existence, keep the conscience of each one of us alive. Obviously, it is an inevitable prerequisite that these individuals in charge have a clear conscience transparent to all. Nonetheless, I must give an account of an instance when, an instance when I was struck with the, the realization that a community conscience does exist after all. I was a remarkable experience of mine from my early years uh, as a priest. I was once shattered up by a group of youths from the local housing estates. Then uh, they said the following. Father, tell us something for we, for we are feeling guilty. Then we sat down together and uh, had a lengthy discussion with them. Only the Lord knows uh, what my words back woke in them. This, this, uh, this is the lot of ministers uh, that uh, we sow the seeds, but we can never know when and where they fall on the good soil and when they remain barren in a stony or and weedy ground. Here at this conference, I speak 
in the hope and belief that uh, what I have to say will touch those who are entrusted with the responsibility of leadership and who, possesses, who possess a sensitive and living conscience. The first. What is called the word of conscience by the spirituality of the West? The Eastern spirituality calls light. I would like to say I'm not Orthodox, but I'm a Byzantine right. I'm a Catholic bishop. In the West, our spirit speaks. In the East, it sees. It is not, no accident that in the non-Christian spirituality of the East, the image, the image of light and the, the notion of seeing play a more important and powerful role. But uh, being a, a Catholic bishop, let me uh, remain uh, in the Christian worldview. While searching for roots, we soon realize that both Im image, image derive from the same source. It is not just a way of thinking we were socialized and automatically adjust to later. If it were, it could be shaped, modified, and influenced by public thinking, culture, and civilization. The great influence of these on our behavior is undeniable. But no sooner that our conscience, long buried, begins to speak again, than the weakness and helplessness of this formerly so dominant perspective is revealed. An example. I have had to the open opportunity to sit at the deathbed of a communist youth activist and party leader and became convinced that, if not before, in the moment of death, our conscience can prevail and make us reconsider the gilding, the the guiding principles previously governing our entire life and all of our actions. To witness a person reconcile with God at the very end of his life and no matter how he lived, see his soul make peace with his creator is one of the most pre precise experiences of a priest. But we should not speak of hope arising only in the shadow of death. It is only worth talking about the conscience of leaders if we believe it can uh, infl influence the present and shape the future. So, the roots of conscience lay deeper in the heart of our human existence. We see here the essence of our humanity since nothing else in creation has a conscience or a soul. The word of our conscience reveals our common createdness, our common root, from the Bushmen in Africa to Americans in the North and South to us in good old Europe. It has degrees, no doubt, and its manifestations are strongly influenced by the environment. Yet, even cannibals know the truth you shall not kill is they do not murder members of their own tribes and families just out of hunger. The environment is indeed capable of influencing the world of our conscience, at least that we can hear from it. Sometimes it is very quiet or dies away completely, gets distorted and we begin hearing some other voice. It comes up especially in situations when hearing that our clear conscience has to say would be too embarrassing, too hard, and uh, by transforming it, we hear what we would like to hear. It is perhaps comf comforting that this is a long process and neither our soul nor our conscience get distorted straight away. Many malign acts are committed before the word of our conscience loses its beauty and clarity. The length of this process may also obscure an infected conscience that lost its way on wrong path much earlier. Our conscience then ceases sending sin signs and a prodding internal nod of approval appears instead. 
slight at first, but with time it becomes stronger, stronger and louder than the noise of street. I'm afraid this may only be silenced at the edge of Anne's great chasme. God forbid that not even then. Second, I have again arrived at the nightmarish image of doom, excuse. Let us rather return to the beginnings when everything is innocent and pure. It is for each to decide when this was. What is certain is uh, that must all return to it. It need not mean a temporal return. In fact, a mature or still growing personality moves forward precisely by making such returning an organic part of his life if he listens to the voice of his conscience again and again. In short, if he examines his conscience. Since our acts have an impact on others, the greater are our responsibilities, the more important are such spiritual examinations. In we are not to poison but provide uplift, our souls must be regularly maintained this is applies to politicians as much as to any man of position of leadership. To act merely acceptably, avoiding scandals and bigger failures is not enough to build a country. A leader must be aware that he guides not with actions, even less with his words, but primarily with his personality. Strange as it may sound, but it is our thoughts that affect our others most, concealed as we assume them to be, yet they, they can easily be seen on our face, in our eyes, movement and gestures. Thus we must watch our thoughts the most. People care not about our words, nor our actions, but our thoughts. That is why we must stay pure to our very marrow, or I should say, the very bottom of our hearts, or find our way back to it. For if someone now cries out, thank God I have kept my purity, I have never diverted from the path of, the, my, cons of my conscience, I have never committed an error or a sin, he either doesn't understand what I mean, or his flawed self-knowledge leaves him little chance to return to his real conscience yet. I must speak about this because of the process, perhaps not sufficiently appreciated, by which people can un un unnoticeably be corrupted by power. I first realized that while as a student I was walking in a park in, near Rome established by Emperor Tiberius, I saw a bu bust of Caligula. Though, though only a head, uh, this was exactly what was terrifyingly revealing. The ruler, not talented even in his youth, was completely corrupted by power. The expression on his face terrifyingly demonstrated what one can turn into if lack of control makes him mad of power. It was all the more striking to me because during my student years in Rome here, I had the opportunity to meet John Paul II several times, and I was always marveled at his remaining a simple man behaving natural even in the midst of the celebration of tens of thousands. Third, I know it isn't easy. Since I became a leader myself, I have been exper experiencing on my own skin the numerous hidden traps on this path and how alert I must be in order not be dazed by power. Leaders also know this temptation, at least those who can still look into their own soul. I talk about conscience in reference to this shared experience. To what depth and how far they need to look back, I couldn't possible now. It is 
or should be a constant and fundamental principle of what Jesus said to those endowed with authority. The greatest among you must behave as if he were the lowest. The leader is if he were the one who serves. It would be quite a liberating feeling for a nation if its leaders followed this simple but difficult to implement precept. It is a truth from the Gospel that uh, is worth returning to time to time and measuring out actions against. Modesty is not some kind of fecklessness that fumbles around aimlessly when deeds are called for. Real modesty tames ambition into effective steadfastness, turns eagerness to act into cooperation. It makes you not to brag, but points out the merits of others. Humility isn't servility, but wisdom to avoid the hubris of mistaken omniscience. Politicians must look into themselves with the Christ-like purity and ask themselves whether the direction of God's realm transpires under their leadership. Were their courageous political leaders dared to adapt the power of this eternal realm that points to the eternal in their transient land, it could have a prophetic power. And yet, no country can be governed in another, in another way. I'm discussing this because I'm absolutely convinced that this is, the, this is what most countries lack and Europe suffer from. Election campaigns uh, disclose the absurdity of today's democracy. Enormous amounts of money, energy, and especially human emotions uh, are wasted on this reclass competition. I was horrified to learn that a so-called hate campaign was also part of the election campaign, that parties don't just talk up their own merits thousands of ways, but spend attention and money to, to sling mud at their opponents as well. Hatred can, however, never bring about the right results. When Pope Francis called for prayer and fasting to stop the war in Syria, he issued the warning that we are all know yet fail to heed. War begets war. Violence begets violence. Peace alone begets peace. To bring this about, uh, we first need to make peace in our own souls. Regular examination of our conscience is therefore a must. If uh, there is no peace in our souls, it will show not only on our face, but in our phrase too. It will leave uh, its mark on the thinking of common folk, on the development of youth, and uh, on the fabric of the homeland in the future. As the leaders think today, so will the country do in a few, year, few years. A frightening responsibility indeed that must sink in. Ordinary people like looking up to someone. It is our ancient desire to, up, to aspire upwards. But who should take look, look up to? Only credible, authentic and trustworthy people can be followed. Their greatness lies in their very modesty and humility. People in charge must grow great in their spirit and soul. It should be a principle of conduct that if they make a mistake, they must have the courage to examine their conscience. They ought, I say, to make self-reflection part of uh, their lives. People of action, the creators of great things particularly, need to post and look into themselves regularly and reflect uh, over their actions. It is not merely a psychological ex exercise, 
Listening to our inner voice is listening to God's voice. This abil abil ability enables us to see, see with God's eyes. This is what makes us human. However, follows only his reason will sooner or later be disappointed in himself. To cover it up with cheerfulness and self-assured phrase works only for a short time. That's just the surface. Inevitably, disappointment in such leaders follow which may even bring on the tragedy of an entire country. You surely know the English ditty. For want of a nail, the shoe was lost. For want of a shoe, the horse was lost. For want of a horse, the rider was lost. For want of a rider, the message was lost. For want of a message, the battle was lost. For want of a battle, the kingdom was lost. And all for the want of the horseshoe nail. This horseshoe nail is the conscience of a responsib responsible leader which must be examined every day. If it is stands firm and straight, if it needs adjustment, the slice displacement, the least visible internal split can be fatal. People under guide, uh, guidance treat and act with confidence if their leader walks not just before them, but stands above them. We need people we can look up to since only looking upwards knows no bounds. A soul meant for eternal life longs for the, this the most. And that's why he is not content with instruction, nor even with explanations. Only when he looks upward, upward does he know he is on the right path. Today's form of democracy has taken this away from the people. We only true glance, uh, explanation e at each other. We want to convince each other, but none of these gives us guidance. But who should people look up to? Respect clearly cannot be forced or commanded. Many have tried, but uh, such dictatorships uh, we have grown tired of. At least I hope that uh, we have become disillusioned uh, for good with the mendicant's worship of a self-appointed leader placed above the people yearning to look, up, to look upwards. A, a tyrant always strikes a pathetic figure. A celebrities too, if I may add, who are not even extraordinary individuals most of the time, evoke the same false image. They are nothing to look up to, and yet, thanks to crafty tricks, the attention of the multitude is lead to them. But sooner or later, these two ends in disenchantment. Respect cannot be imposed, it can only be earned. How? Definitely, definitely not by empty phrases. We have had plenty of experience with those, not even by actions, as they can also be spectac spectacular and yet vacuous and worthless. Our inner world cannot lie. Only those whose, whose inner world is noble can really attract others. Our times need such leaders too. A pure spirit makes a person transparent, and through him God's deeds are made visible and sensible. Astonishing as it may sound, but we must spell it out. Our souls aspiring upwards do need sense. National leaders ought not to settle for this. They must themselves strive to follow the Lord, so that they would truly move people instead of the just manipulate them with crafty tricks. To archive this, we need only to keep our souls clean. 
We need leaders of pure heart and faith who are modest in their work and show humility towards their fellow men. How can people otherwise look up to? Thank you for your attention.